So good morning, everybody. I'm going to start. It's 10 a.m. Um, so my name is Connie Wall. Um, I am a grad student at St. Louis University in the Department of Biomedical Engineering, um, which is a fancy word for putting off the real world in favor of uh, potentially earning more money, but I won't. So, <laughs> sorry, dark joke. Um, so anyway, you're at Poco Biology 101. You're about to learn some real science that connects back to our favorite series. Um, so just a little bit more about me. So this is more of an ecology panel. And you may be asking yourself, why is a biomedical engineer talking about ecology? Well, because I used to be an ecologist. Um, I got my degree in biology from the University of Scranton, Pennsylvania, which is not a place you go to do marine biology. Um, so instead, what I did was I looked at uh, the blue mussel, and I threw it down a couple flights of stairs to see how they broke. Um, so if you want to know more about that, it's fascinating. Um, and then you can't make money breaking seashells, so I got into orthopedic medicine, um, did two bach or I did a Bachelor of Engineering for biomedical engineering, because apparently if you work with shellfish, it doesn't translate to people all that well or something, I don't know. Um, so now that's what I do. I work in cartilage regeneration. So if you want to talk more about that, um, feel free. Um, I also teach physiology and a thermodynamics course. So I'm like really in, into it. Um, I'm fried. I'm definitely fried. I still have not recovered from the semester. So please bear with me. It's also early. So cool. We're all in this together. So you're not here to talk, you know, biomedical engineering, you're here to talk Pokemon, right? Um, we're all Pokemon trainers here. So here are my two teams, because I'm playing through, I'm still playing through the end of Let's Go Eevee, and I'm playing through Sword and Shield at the same time. So these are my two teams, they are my children. Um, I love them very much. I like Dynamaxing my Morpeko. It makes me feel mighty. Um, so there's that. Um, so as we're going through here, we love science, we love Pokemon, but we have to remember that Pokemon was not designed by biologists. It is painfully apparent in every, everywhere we look, there will be an exception to the rules I am giving you. Um, so ultimately, you have to take it at face value. It's not a direct connection. But we can still do a lot of fun things with it. We can learn about ecology, we can learn about physiology, we can learn about evolution, and we can learn about genetics. So you don't have to make a direct link to learn something about your real world, is what I'm trying to say here. So who here was at Pokemon Physiology yesterday? OK, you're getting a remedial lesson, <laughs> only because these are the kind of important bits. This is what we need to know to understand life at its core. So biology is the study of life. You have to define it. There has to be rules for life. You can't just look at a stuffed Psyduck. I love him. He is my son. But he is not alive. <laughs> he is not a living, breathing creature who can grow and adapt to his environment as much as he is adorable and my mascot on social media. Um, so what are our rules here? We have to have a basic unit of function. For argument's sake, Pokemon have cells. The cell is the basic unit of function for anything that's alive. You can have one-celled organisms, you can have multi-celled organisms, but at its very basic, you need that cell. So the structure has to relate to a function. So you have this basic unit and it does something. And the way that it looks, the way that it works, is going to determine the function of that structure. Sound good? Okay. So Caterpie works a lot like a gecko. Caterpie has ridges on the bottom of its feet that expand the surface area and allow it to attach to surfaces way more easy um, than it could without those ridges. So that basically means it can walk up walls, it can walk up ceilings, it can scare the crap out of Misty. You know, <laughs> it allows Caterpie, Caterpie to adapt to its environment. We have the continuity of life, so no one knows how it happens, but it happens. We have eggs. That's pretty good. <laughs> um, we have use of energy. So every living thing has to use energy in some form. Um, whether or not it's productive is up to the organism. Sorry, physiology, you're hearing the same jokes. Um, but uh, Magikarp over here, it tries its best. It's still using energy, still counts as a living being. So growing, I mentioned growing before. We saw this introduced, I believe, in Ruby and Sapphire, where you could actually bring your shroomish to a guy, and he'd measure it for you, and he'd put it on like, this is how big the shroomish are. Um, Pokemon, Do Pokemon Go gives you this um, measurement 
system as well as the Let's Go games and the new Sword and Shield games will actually give you a measurement to your Pokemon. So you can tell that there is a range of small things to large things. Um, you have to respond to your environment. So if you're walking through the tall grass, what happens? Yeah! <laughs> Best answer to that. So yeah, a Pokemon jumps out at you and you're freaking out and you hear the battle music. So you, it, that Pokemon is responding to you walking through its environment. Um, and then of course we adapt and evolve, which in Pokemon is a very tricky subject and you're gonna see why later on. But all growing things not only have to have all of those six other rules, but they have to be able to change. So let's talk about these two. Um, I throw Trubbish under the bus a lot. I thought Vanilla, I thought I switched out Vanilla in there, but whatever. So Trubbish, I used to throw under the bus, but I really like Trubbish. Um, but I remember the initial reaction to the design, um, mainly that that's a bag of trash. He's a living bag of trash. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's discover that. Um, and Voltorb, Voltorb and Electrode. So how are those living beings? Well, all Pokemon have cells. We're just making that assumption right now. Um, whether or not that's true is beside the point. We're making this assumption for the sake of argument. Um, structure relates to function. So, Trubbish has ears, they're antennae, or those bag handles are actually antennae, not ears, excuse me. So when you're walking through the tall grass, Trubbish is able to tell because those antennae can move. Um, oops, continuity of life, sorry. <laughs> so Voltorb, now Voltorb's a little bit tricky. So for those of you who were at physiology yesterday, we defined electricity as a separation of charge. So when you're running around in wool socks on a wool carpet, you're separating things out. When you touch that doorknob, what happens? Zap! That potential is there and you get shocked and you yell, right? So Voltorb potentially has those two sides to separate out those charges. Positive on one end, negative on the other. Sound good? Okay, structure relating to function. Continuity of life. Both of these have egg groups. They can propagate the species. Both of them use energy. You have to feed them berries, you have to feed them poffins um, to keep them happy. So we know that they use energy. Voltorb is actually an electric Pokemon. So it is definitely using energy and letting go of energy in some kind of way. There we go. Growth, both of them grow. Just looking at the mechanics in the new games, we can kind of iron that one over. They both respond to their environment, tall grass, or you're running around that electric plant rolls into you, right? And they both adapt and evolve. Okay, so we have our rules, but it gets trickier. So my introduction, I went from marine biologist studying shellfish to orthopedic studying humans. You know, that's a big jump. There's a lot of subcategories. So we can't exactly say that we can cover all of this in one panel, which is why I have two plus panels. Um, because there's a lot going on here. I personally have only covered maybe five of those. The other five are pretty much Greek to me, and I don't speak Greek. So keep this in mind as we're going through. Um, so Pokebiology, if we want to put that in our last one, but we don't want to bother Piplup, is the study of Pokemon life. And we have all of these professors with projects and their assistants. Um, and then of course, obviously, we have you. So Professor Oak, bless him, um, wanted to build the Pokedex, so catch them all, right? Study them all. He's too old, he can't do it, so he sends you out as a 10-year-old graduate student into the unknown <laughs> to do his ecology work for him. And for someone who is under a very kind PI, I feel a little awkward making that joke, but yeah, I wrangle the undergrads, so I get it. It's pretty much like wrangling Pokemon. So, I love my undergrads, I'm sorry, where's the camera? Okay, um, they're gonna eat me alive. Um, so, off we go to catch them all, which is basically ecology. So you are now an ecologist. If you have all played through the games, that is what you are doing. You're in studying the interactions between organisms and the environment. This includes the Pokemon that you're catching. This includes the trainers that are interacting with the Pokemon that you're catching, aka looking you straight in the eye and challenging you to a fight. Um, so 
everything in the original games technically makes you an ecologist, so congratulations. Um, what we want to know really is what is living where and why, how many are there, and how are they living? So Lapras, why does it live in the ocean? Well, it's a sea turtle situation. Sea turtle dragon thing. But it lives in the ocean because flippers, right? Um, Geodude, um, the newest games once Let's Go Pikachu, Let's Go Eevee came out and I was walking around in a cave and an onyx just showed up. I think I screamed. I think I scared my neighbors because it was awesome. So you can actually see how many there are without having to walk five paces and run into a Zubat and walk another five paces and run into a Zubat. So that was really cool. Um, and how are they living? So Kamalas have to sleep for 18 to 22 hours a day, live in the dream. Um, so those are our three questions there. So let's tackle the first one. Um, what lives where and why? So biomes is a fancy word for the area that you're in. Um, a zone determined by the vegetation type or physical environment. Uh, you know these well. So here's our good old root one. Um, we have deserts, we have forests, we have jungles, we have canyons, we have the snow snom area. We have pretty much anything that you could want in a Pokemon game now exists in some form or another. Um, so I'm really happy to see that, personally speaking. Um, back in the other games, we also have underwater, like deep dive zones. We have saltwater and freshwater. Potentially, um, I took this screen cap off of Bubblepedia, so you see that the inland-ish water is a lighter blue than the ocean, so that kind of makes the inference, remember I'm reaching here, that there are freshwater and salt water, which uh, we ran into an issue last night where my friend was in the wild area and there's a whalemer in a pond, and I don't think that's right. <laughs> Um, so whether or not they're following their own rules is yet to be determined. So remember, not designed by biologists, that Wilmer was very stressed out. Gyarados, yeah, they'll pop up in like a puddle. That's not what actually happens, I promise you. Um, we also have man-made environments, um, which we see a little bit more in Sword and Shield. Um, I, ha I don't have those screen caps up yet, but for those of you who have played the game, you have seen some of the, the bridges, the old ruins situations. Man-made environments still count. Um, a lot of the times when they retire a ship, they clean it out and they sink it to help um, build underwater environments. Um, in the games, we don't necessarily see a lot of that, but we do have bridges, we have the power plant, and we have the bike trail. And I believe there's also a bike trail in Ruby and Sapphire where you can travel under it. You're going to find Pokemon there. So it's a biome. So what is living there? So a population is a group of single species living in the same area. A community are different populations. So much like you have maybe a school community or work community, that's what we talk about um, for organisms in their environment as well. So how many are there? Well, no one knows. They keep releasing new ones and we all keep catching them, right? So gotta catch them all is really gotta record them all. Um, unless you're on Pokemon Go and you're like me and every like, month or so you have to buy the box because you refuse to turn them into candies. That's me. <laughs> I refuse to get rid of them. It's really, really bad. So I'm catching them all when I really just want to record them all, um, like we do in real life. So in real life, we do population studies, we do diversity studies. Um, from my experience as um, an ecologist, what we would do is we would uh, take this PVC square, as you see on the left, and we would turn around, actually, demonstration. We would walk five paces and throw it over our heads so we could randomly pick where we're counting things. So that way we're not going, hey, there's a lot of crabs over here, so I'm gonna plop it down right here. No, that's not how this works. You have to do it randomly. Um, another thing that we would do is we would take these traps, they would be unbaited, so nothing, no food in them, no incentive for anything to swim into there. And then we would pull it up every week and we would count what we would find. So this is up in the Long Island Sound, for those of you who are familiar with the northern areas. Um, but they do these in the Chesapeake Bay as well. So it's kind of see what's there, what's living near our docks, what's living in our bays, to understand 
okay, well, the green crab population is dropping, why is that? Because that usually indicates another bigger problem. So this is easy, like it didn't take, well, in January it took a lot of effort, but it's um, important. So invasive species, um, I'm glad that I'm not giving this in the Midwest anymore, only because sometimes I have to really explain to people that, yeah, you can just pick up a crab. That kind of blows people's minds sometimes. Um, but we have two invasive species on our eastern coastlines. Uh, the green crab, which is uh, on the left there, uh, the green crab is actually native to northern Europe, and it came over in the 1700s. Does any know, anyone know why it went from Europe to here in the 1700s. Yeah, settlers of our continent came over and in the ballast water of the ships came the crabs because if you're a crab, you do not care, right? You're minding your own business, you get sucked up into the ballast water of a ship and suddenly you're dumped out on another shore that looks like home. You're not really gonna care that much. You're not gonna try to get home, right? Um, so that's what happened to our green crab friends. Um, our green crab friends here aren't necessarily a big problem for us, only because they've been around so long we don't know what they displaced. Bless you. We don't know what they displaced. We don't know what was there before the colonists came over. So we cannot tell whether or not this invasive species was actually harmful, which really stinks, right? Um, the Asian shore crab, on the other hand, the guy on the right, um, came over in the 80s, once again, ballast water from ships. This time from the cargo ports over in China. Um, they landed in New Jersey, they kind of spread out. I think they're more in the north, um, as far as I'm concerned, like the northern Atlantic shores, um, definitely Long Island Sound. Um, they're not displacing anything, however, we had to keep an eye on them because they could. They could eat up a certain source of food, they could push other crabs out of their houses, they were a really big deal. All right, so I can see people glazing over. Okay, Connie, why are you talking about crabs? This is a panel about Pokemon. Because I have a spicy take. Bees are invasive. <laughs> These buddies are invasive. So our weasel, our shanks, and our hoot hoot, I could argue, are invasive species of Kanto. Sorry, it's my phone, that's bad, okay. Invasive species of Kanto. So if you are like me and you love spreadsheets, I wasn't expecting that to get to laugh. Does anybody, okay, who else here likes to sit down with a good Excel spreadsheet and a cup of tea? Thank you, amazing, so you know what it's like. So I went through Bulbapedia and I listed out where the original 151 Pokemon lived. And then I went through, at the time, I think there were only 700 Pokemon, so I need to like redo this. Um, but let's go Pikachu and let's go Eevee didn't have any of that, so it made my life easier. But went through, saw where I could catch these things, right? So prevalence, you could say. If I go into any route, I can find Magikarp, I can find Goldeen, Pidgey, Rattata, these are all common. But so are Hoot Hoot, so are Shinx, and so are Weasel. Sorry, there are my methods. Presumably more, right? So over time, Shinx and Weasel made their way into Kanto. What does this mean? Well, this is going to affect how everything lives and interacts. You have Hoot Hoot and Pidgeys potentially competing for space potentially. You have Rattata, Rattata are mice, Shinx are cats. What happens? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, that's a potential source of food that may be depleting. You have Buizel eating Tentacool, Magikarp, Goldeen, they're an otter, they're pescatarian, or yeah, they're an otter slash mustelid. They're going to eat meat, they're going to eat fish. So you're changing the way these environments are behaving, essentially, what's in there and what's going on. So you can try this um, with Pokemon Go. Um, this is back when Pokemon Go wasn't as complicated when I developed this exercise, but you can still do it. Um, you can write down what you catch, the height, the weight, the CP, the moves, the whatever else that they're giving us these days, and you can write down where you caught it. These are, I think the user interface has changed a little bit, but write where you catch it and then go somewhere else. So do this at home and then maybe do it somewhere else or do it here and then do it when you get home and see the difference. That's essentially what you do um, if you're working as a population ecologist out in the field. So, hooray, things you can do at home. 
<laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, so now that we know where they're living, how are, how are they living? So are they interacting, are they adapting? So interactions can be positive or negative. I kind of gave you a foreshadowing in invasive species, the two that I gave you. Not so much big hitters. Out in the Midwest, on the other hand, there's a lot of invasive plants. Um, the European starling wakes me up every morning. They're also a huge nuisance. So they can be a negative influence. Um, and overall, our Pokemon are adapting. So they're developing unique characteristics or behaviors. So here's a Kanto Farfetch'd, which is very, very different from a Galarian Farfetch'd because this Farfetch'd just wants to nest with its leak. The one in Galar wants to beat you up, um, which I found out the hard way. It took me like five tries to get one. Um, so obviously it's going to adapt differently than its Galarian counterpart. So interspe interspecific interactions are types of interactions. You have predation. Is this positive or negative? Thank you. This is a trick question. It depends on what side you're on. If you are that Pidgeot, you are eating good tonight. If you are that Caterpie, you are not having a good time, right? So it really does depend what side you're on. Um, competition, so competing for space. Um, for those of you who had to park your car today, you are familiar with that idea of competing for space, right? Um, you compete for food, you compete for basically just living. Um, so potentially we have Dodrio and Executor here competing for space out in the safari zone. We also have symbiosis. Um, symbiosis is a tricky term here because we also have something called parasitism. Um, supposedly, the symbiosis here is that Shelter gets food and Slowpoke gets to sit up. Um, so it's mutually beneficial. Um, if the Shelter latches onto the head, then we get a Slow King, and that's a little more beneficial, I think, to both of them because the Shelter gets food and the Slow King gets a brain? Uh, not designed by biologists. Okay. Um, so let's move on to some adaptations. Um, there was a whole panel about it yesterday that was also recorded, so you can catch that as well or ask me about it. Um, but adaptations are characteristics or behaviors which enhance survival, which is my jam because I'm a physiologist. <laughs> um, so Chinchu. Chinchu live where? at the bottom of the ocean. So they have little bioluminescent antennae to help them see. Macargo, where do Macargo live? In the middle of a volcano. It is supposedly very, very hot in there and they are apparently very, very hot, 2300 degrees Celsius. A 10 year old wrote the Pokedex. Um, but they upkeep their heat so that way they're not injured by the heat coming off of the volcano. We have Caterpie, which we already talked about. That's that gecko-like adaptation that allows them to scoot all over. Um, and then, of course, Kangaskhan. So Kangaskhan has an adaptation that we see in the real world. Marsupials carry their young in a pouch. Um, whether or not that small Kangaskhan ever gets out of that pouch and lives its own life has yet to be determined. But once again, we don't know. So then we have things like this. So I didn't add any of the new variations on here, um, but we do have our different forms in different regions, which makes perfect sense. Um, so here we have the Rattata. So a Kanto Rattata and a Alolan Rattata. And my theory here, bear with me, is that, a Rattata, that our Kanto Rattata should have been a different color, should have been dark black, dark brown. But if you are a hungry pharaoh, and you see something purple in the grass and it's kind of squiggly, are you going to take the 50% chance that it's food or something that will fight you? Are you going to waste that energy potentially fighting an Ekans? Probably not. So our Kanto Rattata actually adapted to its environment by changing its fur color over time. That's just my theory, don't quote me on that. <laughs> All right, and then we have this guy. I love this guy. I love this guy so much. Um, I wish I had like a pen of him to have in the office um, because really um, this is a plant adaptation. However, they are um, different species of palm tree. So I believe um, the Canto Executor is a brush palm 
And then of course we have the tropical palm for our Alolan variant. Um, this not only depends on the type of plant, but the type of sunlight they're getting. So you'll notice actually that the Alolan executor has darker leaves. That allows it to photosynthesize in a different, more efficient manner than that of the brush palm. So that was explained to me by someone who works at the Botanical Gardens over in St. Louis, and I was very, very happy about it because I don't understand plants. So actually, a lowland executor is way cooler than I ever could have thought. Which brings me to this conundrum, which we touched on yesterday. Do we feed our grass-type Pokemon? What was the answer? Yes, yes you monsters. <laughs> give, them, give them the berries, give them the poffins, please feed them. Um, any grass Pokemon, really, because you need more than sugar to survive. So here's the deal here. Is it symbiosis or physiology for grass-type Pokemon? For Bulbasaur specifically, we know that a seed was planted on its back at birth. How does it get there? Why is it there? We don't know still. Um, but we know that it gets larger as it grows. So photosynthesis and cellular respiration are two processes. We all use cellular respiration. Where does cellular respiration happen? Which is the? Yeah. Didn't think you'd use that outside of high school biology, did you? Congratulations. Um, so cellular respiration makes our energy and it uses sugar. Photosynthesis just so happens to make sugar. These are two processes that involve carbon and a lot of molecules. We went over it yesterday, so those of you that missed it, you don't have to suffer through it today. Congratulations. Um, but our grass-type Pokemon have both of these tools. And as our Bulbasaur grows, the leaves grow, right? And it gets a flower. That means that it's able to get more energy through this electron transport chain. Um, and of course, when it gets really big, um, it, the flower is said to take on vivid colors if it gets plenty of nutrition and sunlight. So here's the deal. You have to feed your Bulbasaurs, your Ivysaurs to get to the Venusaur. That way the Venusaur can be bigger, it can have bigger leaves, it can have different color leaves, and it can absorb more energy. Um, so we see this in the real world. We have carnivorous plants. So carnivorous plants, those of you who have them, you know you have to feed them a mealworm or have a steady, steady stream of fruit flies in the house. So that way it can get its nitrogen, its phosphorus, so it can build up itself, essentially. So feed your grass types. Okay. Oh, that was good timing. <laughs> nice. All right. So here's a quick recap. So we talked about ecology, which is the study of interactions and relationships within an environment. We talked about how biomes set the environment. Invasive species are new populations within a community that are causing problems and making mischief. Um, communities are groups of populations that interact. I should switch those. Um, most species are adapted to their specific environment. So if you take something out of its specific environment and it cannot adapt, it will get injured. All right, so let's, um, where did I, that's weird. So let's talk about the origins of Pokemon now. We talked about ecology. How are we feeling after that? Okay, so here comes the disclaimer. This is a biology panel. We are not going into legendaries. We are not going into the lore of how Pokemon came about. That is for a separate panel, theology, philosophy, whatever. Not me. Okay, so keep that in mind as we're talking about the origins of Pokemon. Um, so really what we have is the fossil record. Um, what's found in the ground, Sword and Shield do a really bad job of this. Because <laughs> you can just mix and match and swap and do whatever the heck you want with your fossils. That is not what happens in real life. First off, there's no Jurassic Park. Also a bad idea for many different reasons. Um, and you really don't want to wreck the shiny things in the ground. Like what is found in the ground should kind of stay in the ground. We know where it is, we know what it is. Let's not disturb it too much. Um, but the Pokemon series is like, nah, let's revive them and make them fight. Uh, so here we have our, oh my gosh, I'm blinking. Hello, brain. Tirtuga, we have our Tirtuga, and then, oh my god, good morning. Aerodactyl, thank you, I'm so sorry. Fried brain, Aerodactyl. Um, and of course, Lord Helix. I don't remember where I have him, but he's in here somewhere. Um, so we have our fossil record. 
We also have a written record. Um, basically, a written record goes off of the fossil record. It's going, okay, these things were here beforehand. So unknown are actually Pokemon, right? So that counts as record of them existing, and then of course you can catch them because they peel off them, it's weird. Um, but we have a written record, and we have some unchanged and sur um, surviving species. So relicanth is actually based off of a coelacanth, um, a deep water fish, and then you have mammoswine, which is based off of a, ma a woolly mammoth, we no longer have woolly mammoths, but the Pokemon world does. And that's just a really blatant example of it, of an unchanged surviving species. My favorite example, however, who recognizes that? Horsey it's a horseshoe crab, yay! So who has um, helped these little guys stay away from the seagulls? One, I have. So who are, which people in here are scared of horseshoe crabs? Is there anybody who's like really freaked out? Okay, I'm here to tell you that they're friendly. They're not gonna poke you. I promise, that tail on the end is meant to help them flip back over when they tip over. So what seagulls will do is that they'll try and flip the horseshoe crab over so they can get to the nice good insides, but that tail sticks into the stand and flips them over. Much like those robots on BattleBots, which I think is also really cool. Um, talk to that after. Um, but the horseshoe crab, really neat. It's, stayed the same for millions of years because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, the only sad part is I don't remember, so I used to work in the, bless you, I used to work in the Long Island Sound area. So Connecticut had protections for horseshoe crabs. Connecticut said that you cannot fish for horseshoe crabs past a certain number. New York, on the other hand, nah, fish all of the horseshoe crabs you want. And you may be saying, Connie, I have never eaten horseshoe crab before. What do you mean people go fishing for horseshoe crabs? Well, horseshoe crabs have a different type of blood than us, which makes sense because they're in a completely different phylum. However, they have an enzyme in their blood that will clot if it finds impurities or bacteria. So there is a test done by the FDA on vaccines and insulin and basically anything else that goes into our bodies that's a liquid that uses horseshoe crab blood to test for impurities. So, Connecticut says, okay, Pfizer, you can't fish more than 500 horseshoe crabs. New York, nothing. Do we trust corporations for that? Not necessarily. I've said that really quietly on purpose. Um, <laughs> so, here's the deal. So, if you live in an eastern Atlantic state, I think the Chesapeake Bay has very good protections for horseshoe crabs. I think the populations have actually risen. Um, at least that was at my last check. Um, but if you live in New York, if you live in Delaware, you live in New Jersey, double check with your state representatives. That is my soapbox. Like, keep the horseshoe crabs alive because otherwise we will have problems. <laughs> Sound good? Also, they are wonderful critters. I love them. Okay, soapbox done, promise. So now we get to talk about the fun things. The whale lord in the room. I'm not talking about Skitty. <laughs> That's a gift. I'm gonna let that one sit. I promise you I'm not talking about skitties. We're actually talking about something more fun than that. Um, we're talking about evolution. So this is from VG Cats. Um, if any of you know, VG Cats are super effective. Great series, um, kind of slow to update, but to each their own. Um, so what Bulbasaur is evolving. Do, 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 do. Congratulations, your Bulbasaur evolved into Ivysaur. No, it didn't. What is that old man talking about? Because that old man is right. Shocker. That Bulbasaur did not evolve. So let's talk about the E word and why I am so picky about it. So evolution, ah, someone clicked. Clicked for someone. Evolution is defined, formally speaking, as descent with modification, typically passed down through generations. So good old Charlie Darwin doing his Charlie Darwin stuff down in the Galapagos. Um, notice these finches, and they all had the same feathers, they had the same body shape, they had different beaks. And he was like, okay, that's weird. So basically what we found out is that the beaks of these finches are built for certain food items. So if you're eating worms, you have one beak. If you're eating seeds, you have another beak. If you're fighting with other birds for the seeds, you have a third beak. It's all of these different things. So they technically were the same bird, 
just with different physical features. And he was like, wow, that's wild. So more on that later. Metamorphosis, a developmental transformation that turns an animal larva or juvenile stage into an adult or adult-like stage. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Oh, that sounds kind of familiar. Gee, I wonder. But let's uh, talk about more about Charles Darwin for a second. So descent with modification, that's a whole term for the fact that you get stuff from your parents. Adaptations have a genetic factor. So if you have a certain adaptation, you are more likely to pass that down to your offspring. Um, so we have our finches. I told you about them really excitedly a little bit early. And oh my god, wow, I lost my mind when they introduced Oricorio, because Oricorio are a little subtle nod to Darwin's finches. Um, they are not exactly the same, because you can catch one and then get the nectar and change your Oricorio, which I think is a cop-out. But anyway, the, we have these four Oricorio, and they are analogous to Darwin's finches. Um, I love it so much. Um, so there's that. Um, we also have something called natural selection. So that's if you have a certain adaptation, you're more likely to make offspring, essentially. Um, love your shinies is my talk here. So shinies, if you are a shiny and you're a bright pink spiel, let's pick on that spiel. You're a bright pink spiel. You're on some dark rocks minding your own business and a bear tick walks up. All the other, yeah, <laughs> yeah, all of the other spiel blend in with the rocks. The pink spiel, not so much, so yeah, oh crap. You, that pink spiel is now dinner. Or you're a red Gyarados and you were unfairly tested on, and now you're in the lake of rage and all you want is a nice, nice other Gyarados to settle down with, but no other Gyarados will come near you because you are bright red. Hmm. Or just a purple whale lord. Also, probably not going to do so hot. So love your shinies. They probably can't do so well in the wild. So love them, cherish them, give them to your friends. They will not make it. <laughs> so shiny hunters, you're doing us all a service. Okay. So how are we tracking evolution? So what we do to track these changes, because we're interested, right? Like where are things moving? Where are things changing, right? That was part of our rules. So we use a phylogeny, which is our relationships between the species, and we build phylogenetic trees. Um, I have yet to be at a convention that gives me a big enough screen to show this in its full glory. Um, there was a paper done out of UC Berkeley um, that actually was someone's master's thesis. I was totally jealous about this. Um, they built a phylogeny of all 800 some odd Pokemon at the time, and they used algorithms to map them out from water type Pokemon. And from Mew? Yes, from Mew and begin in the water. So it starts with the water types, and they map out by type. That was just the way that they hypothesized it. There are a million other ways to track Pokemon evolution descent over time. Um, they published this. <laughs> Once again, my jealousy knows no bounds. Um, if you would like the citation, I have it at the back of this presentation because it's a great read. Um, they tell you what software they used. They ran their computers for like a week straight because the software had to run. They did this with Pokemon to show that you could, to show that you could apply their algorithm. And then I'm pretty sure they went on to do something real with the, alg the algorithm, but this was really neat. It was a great way to show a model. Um, anyway, geeking out. That's why I'm here. Making these is also super hard, so good on them. So we talked about evolution. Now let's talk about metamorphosis, which um, sounds an awful lot like Pokemon evolution, where you go from a baby type Pokemon and you metamorphose or you change into another Pokemon that could potentially reproduce, or even another Pokemon that could potentially reproduce. So uh, if you take anything away from this panel, other than the fact that it's 10 a.m. and I'm tired, please take this away. It's not Pokemon evolution, it's Pokemon metamorphosis. But from a marketing standpoint, you don't want six-year-olds running around saying my Pikachu metamorphosed into a Raichu. So I can see why they made that choice, but metamorphosis. Cool? Take that away. Thank you. Yes. All right. Yeah! So another quick recap. So fossil record, um, 
remains found indicating past species. Um, evolution is descent with modification. Metamorphosis is Pokemon evolution, and it's a transformation from a juvenile to an adult. We have a phylogeny, which is an evolutionary relationship, how we got from point A to point B over time. Phylogenetic tree is the depiction of those relationships. And wow, it's 40 minutes of just straight, solid bio. How are we feeling? Okay, feeling good. No one has left yet. This is great. Um, so qualifications of life, we talked about the rules. You can't just label anything as alive. You do have to fit it into the box. Um, ecology, we talked about biomes and invasive species. We talked about adaptations, evolution and metamorphosis, and tracking that change. So like, pat yourselves on the back. Especially those of you who are hungover. Good job. <laughs> Excellent job. So here are my citations. Um, I don't own any of this. Don't sue me. I don't own any of this. I'm using this under Creative Commons License 9. Um, I did, however, organize this entire presentation as well as Pokemon Physiology. So that I'll give. But I don't own Pokemon. Here's the phylogeny if you would like to take a photo of this slide. Um, I also have, the, I will have the slide up here um, once I'm done if you need a better view of it. Um, I thought I had a QR for it, but I think that's the next slide. Um, the comic was super effective number 50 at VGCAP slash super effective. Great, great series. Um, and I'm married to my Campbell's Biology 9th edition. Um, here are some cool people who have helped me throughout the way. Sorry, mom. Um, I. Oops, oh, this is an old sign tunnel. Um, sorry for my bosses back in Missouri for peacing out for a couple weeks. Um, check out the two in orange, Andy Cluthie and Professor Sacharam. They help me out a lot. Um, and everyone in purple is great. And Marty is my brother. He has a Gumi farm. If you need a Gumi, hit him up. Um, here are some contributors from past conventions. Oh, there's my QR code. There you go. There's a better citation. It's all in IEEE as well if you need to put it into Zotero. Um, it's a great time. So yeah, with that, um, Shar, can you help me out with the questions? I don't know if that microphone works. Can you check and see if that microphone works? Nope. Nice. OK, so what we're going to do is Charlotte is going to run around the room to hands because I am indecisive. I moved from Connecticut to St. Louis, and now I'm too nice to live my life. So Charlotte is going to run around to answer questions, or pick up hands, repeat the question back to me. I'll repeat the question back. We'll figure it out. Mr. Slutterman over here. OK. So, I think it's just different types of growth. I think pumpkaboo itself is probably an app. Okay, so sorry. The question was, are the different sizes of pumpkaboo an adaptation or a question of growth? And I think it's more of a question of growth because they're pumpkins. Because the pumpkaboo, the pumpkaboo isn't in the pumpkin itself. So I think the adaptation is the type of squash it picked, and the growth is the pumpkin. So we could have had like spaghetti squashaboo, <laughs> which was a really weird sentence to say, I'm not gonna lie. Um, if you wanna know more and you want my business card, I will also have it up here if you wanna grab it. Sorry, okay, yay. So, Pokemon like fire types and ice types, do you think maybe they're able to like So Pokemon like fire types and ice types, are they able to regulate their bodies for humans to interact with them? Probably. I mean, I think there was a discussion yesterday we had about Rapidash and whether or not we sit on fire. And we definitely don't. Um, but there is a way to regulate, I think, those to a point. Like obviously things like Vanillite, they're pure ice. So you probably need gloves to touch them, but I'm sure that they don't want to hurt their owner, or sometimes they do, maybe, um, depending. But I think there is a regulation to that, because you also have to be able to regulate your body and an environment in general. So that's homeostasis, essentially. So the ability to stay put, essentially, in any given metric. So that means like, if you're just sitting here, you're not like, sweating, you're not shivering, you're just kind of you. But if you were hot, you'd start sweating to cool yourself down. Same basic idea, I think, with the extreme types, but to a point, because you don't want to freeze your Macargo. It's probably not the best. So, not that you could. Not that you could. No, 2300 degrees Celsius. Mm, yikes. Flame body. Yeah, yeah, flame body. So. 
Yeah, so yeah, um, so the comment up here was Ash tries to make friends with the ponytail and it burns him. And then towards the end of the episode, through the power of friendship, it likes him and it doesn't burn him anymore. So yeah, absolutely, we've seen proof. So thank you. Yep, yep. Um, so you mentioned that there were a couple species you thought were invasive, and then you cited some real examples of crabs that weren't mm -hmm. damaging to the environment. Mm -hmm. now. Um, and my mind went to, I think it's the Asian carp over Oh, yeah. It's really terrible. Yeah. Big problem. Yes. Zebra mussels, too. Yeah, yeah, that sounds familiar. Um, and I'm curious if you think either those three or anything that you know, stood out to you as this species or this Pokemon could, uh, is actually doing some significant damage. Has some like, negative impact I would... thrown off their. Yeah, so thank you for that Asian carp reference because I've had Asian carp, it's tasty. They had it for free at the Illinois State Fair. That's how much of a problem it is that they're just handing it out. Um, delicious. Um, but I think the question was, is there any Pokemon that have that same negative effect? Right, yeah, that I can see. So I would say Buizel. I think Buizel is an honest problem because you have something, you have a basically an alpha predator there, you have something that's at the top of the food chain that's able to eat everything in the water. And if you let that go unchecked, you're not going to have the basis of the food chain anymore. Um, I'm trying to think of where else I see that in the real world. It's been a while since I've been in ecology, which is why I'm rusty. Um, I know that um, Japanese honeysuckle out in the Midwest does that to the plants in the environment. It takes up space and the nutrients. So everything else dies out around it. Um, that's the plant analogy. It, um, the Asian carp is the same way as well. It's taking up space and it's eating the bottom of the food chain, which means nothing else can live, essentially. So thank you. Yeah. Sorry, she's running. Domestic cat, oh, absolutely. So I used to, sorry, sorry, I will get to you, but you're right. So I used to have a pro, I used to be not educated on the subject. I'm like, no, oh, like let them out, but no. Domestic cats, not only is it a danger to the cat itself, you are killing native bird populations. So as much as you think your kitty can defend itself, it can't really. Or even if it can, it's killing other things. And I love my dragon. I wish I could, I don't think I have a photo of my cat. I would totally show my photo of the cat. My, dra my dragon is a Norwegian forest cat and she is a huntress. And she stays inside. Oh yeah, she's beautiful. Come see a photo of her. Um, she stays inside because she will kill everything in the yard. She will try to fight a bear and win, honestly. Um, like, my friends have seen this cat. So keep your cats indoors, because they are also a native invasion species, um, which is defined as something that's not necessarily from another place, but has been released into something that's not its proper area. Um, you're seeing this actually with black bears are going down in Missouri. They're a native species, they're on the continent, right? But they're moving south, and they're causing problems. So, stuff like that. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Forget about that one. Yes? I'm just curious what your thoughts are on people in there, or lack of from the biologists. Oh. <laughs> um, we had, yeah, actually, we had someone bring it up. I think the man back there actually brought up the fact that maybe Marowaks are just really maladaptive to childbirth or egg laying, and the Marowak naturally passes away, which doesn't explain the daycare center does not explain the daycare center at all. Um, but something like that, potentially? Or it's just a really weird species that just eats its young or, you know, like kills off a parent, like black, wet, like spiders. Spiders eat the male. Sorry, guys. Um, but it could be something like that. There's a million theories. I do like the whole thought that a Marowak is maladaptive to breeding, though, so, yeah. Okay, sorry, Charlotte will come up. <laughs> You're good, you're good. Um, so you mentioned earlier that you figure that crabs um, have still need to be like where they would be on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you'd ever considered the um, theory like, that there's a more sort of like, I don't know if this is the right term, but like kind of like hybrid carnivores, like crabs eating using actual food is a more efficient way for them to get energy if they're capable of surviving on Yeah, so it depends. I see what you're talking about. So. There are different ways to get energy. Um, 
but either way, it depends on the organism itself, what the best way to get energy is. For humans, that's eating food. We cannot photosynthesize. I don't care who tells you to show your butt where. You cannot photosynthesize. You can't do it. Um, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, come up and I'll show you later. Um, you can't photosynthesize, you need to eat food. For those of you who keep plants, it's all well and good that you put them in some dirt and water them and put them in sunlight, but you really should be adding some fertilizer in there after even a couple years. I had this argument with my boyfriend who has a garden and they haven't retilled it in like 10 years and nothing is growing and it, they're frustrated. I'm like, gee, I wonder why. There's no food in the ground. Anyway, sorry. Um, <laughs> so it's that kind of thing where you can also have symbiosis. So coral have photosynthetic algae in them. So coral eat what they can eat and the algae, algae also give them sugar. So there's a million ways to ingest energy. Yes, and then this man in the red Charlotte after them. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yo, okay, we're doing it. Uh, there we go. So ghost Pokemon, they're dead, right? I'm just gonna cover it because it's a good slide and I'm only slightly ashamed by it because I taught or helped teach a thermo class. So ghost types, come on, let's go. Oh no, did it, ah. So before this generation, once again, spent a lot of time on Bulbapedia. Um, and these are the things that I have found that could help me crack this puzzle, right? Because what the heck. Um, basically it boils down to there's a gas component there's some kind of thermodynamic component. There's a fast energy release, because when you release energy quickly, it's a sound. If you release it slowly, it gets hot. Um, different, sorry, different lecture. Um, and then of course there's light sensitivity. I have to go through all of this. So we have all of these things. Dust skull, I got nothing. Can pass through walls, it's nice. Um, so thermodynamics, ghost types somehow use energy and ignore entropy. So they can use energy and get all of it back or something to that extent. They break the laws of physics somehow, but it does seem to be some kind of gas component. So these are gas molecules surrounded by some kind of cell. Um, there was a theory at Kineticon a couple of years back that the cells in the Pokemon world can be in any form, which doesn't sit right with me, but that's where it is. Um, so yes, they're dead. But they're also not dead. Yay! Sorry. Um, you can come talk after. So I'm gonna talk to you. That's a good question. Okay. <laughs> Give you the ending one. Yep. Uh, is there a working theory as uh, uh, to how a Pokemon like Eevee, which can metamorph metamorphosize into any number of um, radically different uh, yeah. species, uh, species, different forms? Right. Uh, how will that? Could so the question was, how can Eevee metamorphose into like eight different types of things, essentially? Is that more or less? Okay. Um, so this I consider to be a parallel argument to Ditto. So Ditto is a mass of stem cells that can do whatever they want. So essentially Ditto's stem cells can form different types of cells, any type of cell it wants. Eevee, on the other hand, is more like what we would call like a mesenchymal stem cell, adipose type stem cell, where it still has a fixed spot to go to. So mesenchymal stem cells can turn into cartilage, they can turn into bone, um, they can do, I think someone tried to do liver. Um, there's a whole world of it. So basically what I'm saying is Eevee has stem cells but they get to a point and then they can't do anything else anymore, which is closer to the mesenchymal type. So if you expose those cells to a firestone, it's gonna turn into a flareon. Those cells are going to get the signal to say, okay, we're a flareon now. Um, much like if I give my mesenchymal stem cells insulin, they're gonna say, all right, we're cartilage until we're not anymore and we make kind of cry. So, you know, it, it's the same kind of idea. Um, whereas Ditto can do whatever the heck it wants. So I, I imagine to be a, a similar deal. Good, thank you. Hmm? So what Pokemon would you say is like most scientifically interesting or would you most theoretical? I got this question yesterday and I'm still not prepared for it. Um, oh gosh, I probably would go down the Ditto route. 
Um, probably, I've gotten more into cell bio these days, so I think that's especially fascinating to have a cell type that'll turn into like a Gyarados and then turn back or like do some of the fun, like we were talking about like the fire and ice extreme stuff, like to have a cell do that and then return back. Um, we do know, however, that Ditto can't transform forever. So there is some kind of adaptation versus injury situation going on there, so I would love to do that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, and then go to the back. Charlotte, back. Charlotte, go to the back. Sorry, keep going. Uh, so you have a presentation for why just T Rockets now is able to speak English. Like, is there anything? I mean, that's more of a creator issue, I think. Although you have like those dogs that can say like, I love you. Um, I swear Dragon knows English, she just can't speak it, except for no and now. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a creative choice. Um, parrots, I guess. Some parrots can intelligently hold a conversation. Um, we know that some primates can use sign language to communicate, so it's probably not out of the ordinary, but the Meowth choice was a little weird. And why he had a, like a New York accent. Also, I don't know what they were doing with that. Um, but good, good question. I mean, we have intelligent, you know, animals, so. Okay, Charlotte, go. <laughs> I'm in the right slide. I'm gonna leave that one up while I go looking. Um, so rock and steel type Pokemon um, are just specialized cells. They just have specialized cells um, that create mineralized tissue. So really what happens is you just like, everybody's asking me like thesis questions today. Cause this is being recorded, right? I just do my proposal right now. Um, so really what happens is you have specialized cells, they secrete certain proteins, and those proteins are able to trap minerals into a matrix, what we call a matrix. So it's kind of like you're making like concrete where you lay down like the rebar, right? So that's like our protein, and then you have concrete filled in. That's like our mineral mineralization. So that allows for tough stuff um, around some soft stuff. So you can still get like blood vessels in there. Um, you do this, like, see, like they do it all the time. Like bivalves are amazing with their mineralized tissue. They're able to secrete these proteins and take whatever they want out of the water and shove it in their shell. Um, so if you see a re really pretty seashell, by the way, it means it was in polluted water. Hmm. Sadness. But that's where rock and steel really come from, in my opinion, just because we see it all the time on Earth. You do this too, your bones are mineralized tissue, you all rock. Hey. All right. Cool. Go. <laughs> um, so to kind of expand on that EV question that was asked earlier, um, certain animals that do have more close real life, like they can only do so under certain like, specific environmental conditions, right? Mm -hmm. So is it possible that you use something like that where like it just has a wider range of conditions than most other creatures that will resist you? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, you have a certain stem cell, you're gonna give it a certain um, communication, you're gonna tell it what to do, and it's going to do it. Or it's going to laugh in your face, and then the next experiment is going to do it. Whichever. So yeah. Okay. This, um, pause. Um, this is our last question, because it's 10.58, and I need to let people um, set up for the next one. So um, if you would like my business card, they're up here. I'm gonna finish up this question, and you can meet me outside if you wanna talk more. If Mewtwo is a clone of Mew, why isn't it just another Mew? Because they messed up. Okay. <laughs> um, no, I mean, there's, there's that. So Mewtwo was also supposed to be an improvement upon Mew. So what they were doing is they were messing with Mew's genes and altering them to the point where you have Mew, but you have a better version of Mew. Um, so it's kind of like using that, you know, DNA altering technology to say we want this part of the DNA, but not that part. But hey, wouldn't it be neat if this was a dragon type too and injecting some of that in? Yeah, it's just kind of like, we want to make the biggest, baddest Pokemon we can, so let's just splice everything in there. So that's why it doesn't look like Mew, because it is, but it's better. Ultimate yeah, literally the ultimate designer baby, thank you, because <laughs> it is. So yeah, if you see that technology, that is real life technology now, which is kind of spooky. Um, if you want to have that chat, probably outside later, because I do have to pack up and let the next person come in. So thank you all for coming.